Our lecture this evening is co-sponsored with the Center for Medieval Literature at Odense in New York, the Henri Perrin Institute for Medieval Studies at Ghent, the Center for Medieval Studies at Fordham, and the University of Santiago de Compostela, with whom we have close collaborations. Um, and we all wish you a very warm welcome, whether you're here in person or joining us online. I'm delighted to be introducing our pair of speakers this evening, Professors Alistair Minnis and Peter Brugger, and also delighted to be welcoming Alistair back to York, where he was both director of CMS and head of the Department of English. Professor Minnis is the Douglas Tracy Smith Professor Emeritus of English at Yale. He is an eminent scholar of medieval literature whose work, shaped by the study of philosophy and theology and latterly modern neuroscience, is deeply interdisciplinary. His field-defining publications extend across decades, ranging from his early and still seminal work on authorship through work on the Roman de la Rose, on Chaucer, on concepts of paradise, to his new work exploring the wider cultural significance of neuroscience and prosthesis. This is where the collaboration with Peter comes in. Professor Brugger is Professor Emeritus of Behavioral Neurology and Neuropsychiatry at the University of Zurich, and he's also been head of the Neuropsychology Unit at the Valens Rehabilitation Center. Thus, Professor Brugger is a practicing clinician as well as a much-published author on a wide range of neuroscientific issues and challenges. The collaboration of Professor Minnis and Professor Brugger represents cutting-edge work across humanities and natural sciences, and we're looking forward to the new insights it will bring us this evening into interdisciplinary study in the Middle Ages. We're really honored to have them speaking to us this evening, um, and for Professor Minnis tomorrow to be leading a master class for our MA students. This evening they're going to be speaking to us on the topic of phantomology from soul to brain, medieval studies meets neuroscience. There will be questions at the end of the lecture, and I will explain then how we're going to manage them. So if you want to be thinking of your questions, there will be an opportunity for that. Alistair. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thank you everyone who uh, organized this wonderful event. A special word of thanks to Peter Baruga, who very kindly came from Zurich to be with us today. Uh, Peter um, is a practicing clinician as well as being a much published author. His uh, list of publications runs to 18 pages, single spacing. Uh, welcome, Peter. Um, now, the uh, central idea on which our joint talk is based is that um, is the neuroscientific belief that there is a likeness, um, a schema or an image of the body contained within the brain, what con which controls the pleasure and the pain felt by the human body, even to the extent of generating sensation when the body part in question is absent. Hence the fascinating phenomenon of phantom limb. Uh, amputees can experience sensory qualities, including pain, seemingly originating uh, in a limb that is no longer there. Uh, my own emphasis today um, is on what might be called whole body phantoms, not just the limb, the entire body, uh, the complete loss of all the body's limbs in death. Medieval Christianity insisted that after death the disembodied soul could experience pain in hell and in purgatory and pleasure in heaven, experiences which continued when the body and soul reunited at the general resurrection. The body came back. But how could incorporeal whole body phantoms, how could they, without a body, possibly enjoy or suffer lacking corporeal organs? Uh, as you can see from these horrifying prophecies, there's a lot going on about pain, <laughs> corporeal um, trauma, etc. Uh, and of course, uh, whereas people like Peter work to alleviate pain and to cure it, these guys need pain. Without pain, there cannot be uh, purgatory or there cannot be hell. Uh, and without uh, a pleasure, there cannot be heaven. Uh, but how can this happen if we are lacking the body, uh, the corporeal organs generate these emotions? Now, when medieval visual artists depicted the human soul, they often used a simple image of a small human body, this is rather cute, I think, um, leaving the uh, human body, a little um, mini-me. We're going to have a technical intervention number two. A, tickle, a technical, aha. Having trouble here. Oh, right here. <laughs> 
I'm in it loud enough. So if you just put because it's Give it, up, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, is that better in terms of audio? Yeah? yeah. Okay, I'll keep going and uh, until, uh, until, until I'm stopped again. Um, oh, okay, uh, right there. Minimi, okay? Um, let's get back to the Minimi. Uh, now, of course, uh, nobody would think has believed that that actually happened, that there actually was a little body uh, within the body, but um, prominent uh, um, among some medieval thinkers was the idea that there was an image uh, of the body within the soul. And prominent among those was St. Augustine, who I was spending quite a bit of time with, um, arguably the greatest uh, theologian in Western culture, who devised and deployed the idea of a body schema, which he called a similitudo corporis, uh, a corporeal likeness or image contained within what he called the soul, which in many ways anticipates the contemporary neuroscientific belief that the brain holds within it an image of its owner's body. Here, Augustine got closer to modern neuroscience than any other medieval theologian, I think. A large claim, I know, I hope to substantiate it. Um, many moderate neuroscientists claim there is no pain without brain. So I'm looking at that transition from soul to brain. Um, here uh, is the crucial passage in Augustine's De Genese Ad Literam, his long commentary on Genesis. He says, people who have been detached from the senses of the body, uh, this is uh, what uh, in your scientists would call an out-of-body experience, an OBE. So I will be using the term OBE in the course of the lecture. So, so Augustine is very excited about out-of-body experiences because he says even more than in dreams, uh, they provide testimony that there is an image of the body in the soul. Um, so anyway, people experiencing OBEs describe vivid sights and experiences, more so than if they had been describing dreams. Being carried away from the body's senses, um, they have just lain there as if they were dead. They have witnessed the pains of hell. The sights experienced in these cases are not bodily sights, but sights resembling bodily ones, and yet real joy and real affliction are involved. Now, how is this possible? Um, because, Augustine says, um, the souls in question have borne in themselves some likeness to their own bodies, the, the uh, similitude nem corporis, by means of which it was possible for them to be carried away to those otherworldly places and to experience such things with something like their senses. In an OBE, when the body is lying there, senseless but still not totally dead, the soul has a likeness of the body which enables it to experience many things which the person can speak about when they have been restored to the living, when they come out of their OBE, when they wake up. Therefore, Augustine cannot see why, if this is true, um, we can infer from this that the soul will retain that same likeness when its owner dies and the soul leaves the body for good. So then, the soul may well uh, maintain, continue to possess that above-mentioned corporeal likeness, which is not bodily, but like a body, even in the nether world. Now, this would enable post-mortem pain and pleasure problem solved. Now, this is totally revolutionary for many reasons. The first thing is there's no place to have, there's, there's no need to have a material location of hell. Centuries of thinkers say, said hell is in uh, the bowels of the earth, at the center of the earth, but for Augustine, no, no, it's all in the soul. Heaven and hell are in the soul. Um, now, um, this um, um, idea, uh, these ideas of Augustine, uh, enjoyed a wide popularity because they were included in the big theological textbook of the Middle Ages, Peter Lombard's Book of Sentences. So if you were a budding theologian, you couldn't miss these ideas. Everybody read the sentences. It was the big university set text. So, um, but um, it um, didn't go down very well with the Aristotelians, more on them in a moment, but it worked very well. It was very popular among the Cistercians. Um, here's the challenge. Is pain and pleasure fundamentally in the soul, which has a bodily likeness within it that ensures the continuity of pain and suffering from life through death? 
Here is a text that people thought was by Augustine. It's not. It's the De Spiritu et Anima, uh, and uh, some of it is a pastiche of what Augustine said in De Genese ad Literam. Um, and here we are assured that when the soul withdraws from the body, it takes with it all its faculties, sense knowledge, imagination, reason, understanding and intelligence, the concusible powers, the irascible powers, and from these the soul passes over into either joy or pain. This is supported by a powerful elaboration of the Augustinian likeness um, of the body, expressed in more straightforward, if rather clunky prose uh, in this passage. When you sleep, something like a body may appear, which is not your body, but your soul, nor is it a true body, rather the likeness of your body, similar to corporis. While your body is reclining, that likeness can't be walking about. Your bodily tongue may be silent, the likeness will speak. Even if your eyes are shut, the likeness has vision. And so in that likeness, you can recognize a detailed replica of your flesh. In that likeness, your soul can wander over familiar or unknown places capable of of feeling joy or sadness. In the likeness of its body, the soul of a dead man, like that of a sleeping man, can experience good and bad things. The things to which soul deprived of bodies become attached, for better or worse, are not corporeal, but similar to corporeal things. Now, um, uh, that kind of thinking took a massive jolt with the influence of the rediscovered Aristotle in the medieval West, who came uh, with an extensive body of commentary from his Muslim commentators. Uh, and, and here we have a, a move to the notion of how uh, we, we have the Christianizing of Aristotle. Um, now, um, the uh, people who obviously were influenced by um, Aristotle included Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas, uh, and they loathed De Spiritu et Anima. They said the most nasty things about it possible. Um, for example, Albert the Great said, um, uh, uh, it is a simile, sorry, it is a it is a silly proposition rather than a true argument, and he can't be bothered to read it. Uh, Thomas Aquinas says, this is not Augustine, this is a mere Cistercian, and therefore it is not authentic, and therefore um, uh, it does not have the proper authority. Now, the authentic Aristotle, uh, oops, the authentic Augustine, sorry, was treated more deferentially, but in a rather clever way. This is where you say, well, he's only quoting something, you know, he's just trying out an idea, he doesn't really believe it, which is fantastic, because you can take anybody's text and make it mean something completely different, uh, and that is what Thomas Aquinas does. Uh, frequently in De Genesee and Literam, Augustine speaks as what inquiring and not deciding. Therefore, uh, Aquinas excuses him from the right claim, as he sees it, that a viable comparison can be made uh, between the soul of a sleeper and the separated soul. This can't be done, Aquinas asserts, because the sleeper's soul uses the corporeal organ of imagination, whereby corporeal similitudes are imprinted, following sensory perception of the outside world, which cannot be said about the separated soul, the soul in heaven or in hell, lacking its body, since it lacks its corporeal organs and is deprived of contact with that outside world. Uh, Aristotle was wonderful, but he brought a few problems with him. Uh, he had this um, awkward idea uh, that the soul was the animating function of the body and it perished at death. He didn't believe in the resurrection of the body. So a few little tricky things which medieval Christians had to cope with. Um, uh, his Christian interpreters were tasked with explaining several things. First of all, uh, what went on in the separated soul in current heaven or hell, as we believe, or some believe it to exist now, and also uh, what uh, happens when the body rejoins the soul at the general resurrection. And they spent the wi spent wasted um, a lot of time trying to work this out. They just, but Aristotle was so influential, but uh, he he brought many problems with him. And. No wonder, given that complexity, Cistercian, Augustinian thought on the subject proved so popular. And uh, it is my thesis that Dante is heavily influenced by it in a puzzling passage in the Commedia, uh, where uh, the Dante persona uh, converses with, I'm calling them whole body phantoms, ombre shades uh, of the other world. Now, um, here we have the crucial passage uh, where um, we're told that in the case of the separated soul, some powers, 
are muted, uh, as it were, the, <coughs> the mute button has been pressed, so to speak. Others are more acute. The shade of Statius, having been called upon to speak by Dante's spirit guide, explains that when the soul is loosed from the flesh, certain faculties will become mute, temporarily shut down, not extinguished, just temporarily shut down, but memory, intellect, and will shall be more acute in action than before. Now, Aquinas had said, when the soul leaves the body, the sensory powers do not remain in the body actually, act to, but virtually, virtuti tantum, as in their principle or their root, in Principio vel radicae. After the resurrection, these will unmute, blossom afresh, be more vigorous than before. The thing is, though, that uh, Dante is not talking here about what happens after the resurrection. He's talking about what's happening right now in the case of the souls his persona is speaking with in purgatory. So this is happening in the present day heaven. So in other words, this is so Augustinian, uh, the idea that um, the, um, uh, 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 some of the faculties of the soul become more vigorous in the separated soul, much more than they were when the soul was in the body. So then Dante is not waiting for the resurrection to make this point, as it were. However, uh, the, um, the shades are waiting for the resurrection. They're eager to uh, regain their bodies. Dante powerfully speaks of the desire of the soul for its body. And, but what do they do? Well, in purgatory, they have lots of air around them, and air, would you believe, is a wonderful prosthetic material. You can shape it into all kinds of wonderful shapes. Um, and so they are so passionately desirous of rejoining their bodies. What do they do? They're making fake bodies. They're making facsimile bodies of air as they anticipate uh, the return of their souls to their bodies at the general resurrection. And um, this is an incredible craftsmanship, you see. Uh, it even includes organs of every sense, including sight. Uh, sight being regarded as the most impressive, the most noble uh, of the senses. And if it includes sight, uh, that's pretty much a full facsimile of the human body. That's being shaped out of air. So then, processes which occur within the soul are given facsimiles, as it were, of the relevant bodily organs. Uh, and this is uh, part and parcel of, of course, Dante's uh, uh, wonderful affirmation of uh, uh, the hope and expectation of the um, resurrection uh, when, um, when the bodies uh, will rejoin their souls and then they will, uh, our souls once more will rejoin our bodies. Our person then will be more pleasing because it is complete. The idea of personhood is vital here. Uh, there has to be this rejoining of all the bodily parts, okay? Uh, the body parts may have been scattered all over the world, uh, eaten by animals or by a cannibal, uh, whatever, but uh, at the resurrection, they will all come together to form the human body again and it will be rejoined by its soul, its unique soul. There's no body swapping, as it were. So, now here, arguably, uh, there are interesting links between the uh, neuroscientific idea of the body in the brain, I believe. Um, now, here we uh, have the standard, uh, rather simplistic view, which uh, Peter Brugger will, I know, complicate, that there is um, a part of the brain which uh, creates, actually, mm, a body. Uh, and so um, the entire body is mapped on the um, somatosensory cortex. Uh, and every point on the brain surface has a corresponding point in the brain. So the brain constructs versions of a body image or schema comprising evanescent and fragmentary evidence derived from multiple sensory systems, vision, uh, proprioception, hearing, etc. So we have a stable internal mental construct of a unitary corporeal self. Perhaps at this point, uh, modern neuroscience meets medieval studies, but is it? a happy meeting altogether, um, because may we detect in such theorizing, both medieval and modern, the affirmation of a troubling ableism. Um, is a missing body part indeed an impoverishment that must be remedied or even bettered by prosthesis, lest amputees are doomed to a psychic life of incompleteness? Um, this looks like an ideological parallel to the insistence of medieval resurrection theology on the completeness of the body, all its parts, whatever it may have happened to them, uh, requiring restoration and full integration. But 
we need to ask, is an entire body truly necessary for personhood? If the brain contains and asserts a body schema, which presupposes and privileges an entire body, does this assume a sort of organic determinism which maps out an inevitable destiny for both body and mind? Have some of today's neuroscientists come up with a theory of predestination which offers a potent replacement for a doctrine that generations of theologians argued about? There is, of course, more, much more. Um, the premise of my own piece of this talk is that uh, the awe-inspiring position which over many centuries was occupied by the soul has now quite dramatically been taken over by the brain, by which I mean the brain is credited with many agencies, activities once attributed to the soul. And let me take this even further. But even theologians held selfhood to be determined largely by the soul. Now, given the contemporary replacement of the soul with the brain, is selfhood now too easily and simplistically being conflated with the biological brain? Uh, is the brain the only part of the body we need in order to be ourselves? Uh, is personhood the same as brainhood? Science fiction has got its own way of addressing this. Um, uh, there are many stories of, of how brains are taken out of dying bodies and artificially preserved, kept alive until the time at which they may be inserted into a fresh body, a robot's head, or some quasi-human construct. Um, Dennis Potter's play was innovative in this regard. Here you have a photograph of a brain, complete with head, being kept alive. Um, Robocop um, uh, is uh, a more obviously popular version of the same thing, the brain of the cop is being kept alive in his, uh, in his uh, cyber body. Going even beyond this, transhumanism, uh, which holds that humans can upload themselves into a virtual afterlife of their choosing. Um, but do, can we really dispense with the material entirely uh, at that point that was being wrestled with by medieval theologians? Do we have to stay with the idea of brains being preserved in the physical form in order that thought can continue and a person can survive for as long as their brain survives. Uh, I hope that Peter Bogor will explain some of those questions. If you would like to hear some more of my thinking, I have a little booklet that uh, uh, I can uh, recommend you to. But now I would like to welcome Peter Bogor, who will take over uh, this um, part of the lecture. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much. Oh. Yes, the mic. Thank you very much uh, for that wonderful that you solved all the hellish problems of technique. Well, I explained this. Hopefully you won't have to. So. No, I <laughs> hope not. And also thanks, um, cordial thank you to the University of York for having me here. It's, it's wonderful. I will give a brief introduction into phantomology as the study of the cerebral uh, basis of uh, body and self. The term phantomology is not mine. Uh, it's coined, it was coined by Stanislav Lem in one of his famous books, Soma Technologia, which dates from the days University of York uh, was founded. So he, he really visionary anticipated problems of artificial intelligence there and the problems, the, uh, problems of, in society of virtual reality uh, down to details of gaming obsession and uh, cyber sex and uh, chapter two is labeled phantomology uh, as the science of the virtual reality in the brain and I think really uh, Stanislav Lem uh, deserves to be called kind of a um, Jules Verne of cognitive neuroscience. So the scope of phantomology is broad. It spans from out-of-limb experiences to out-of-body experiences. I'm afraid I have to skip some the intermediating steps between limbs and body. Uh, phantoms of a paralyzed half-body, uh, a doppelganger experience and so on. For the sake of time, I uh, won't talk about it. I will also o omit uh, anything hellish like... Um, mentioned by Alastair in his talk, uh, because it concerns only the sinners among us. I will also avoid to, to talk too much about pain and amputation, because actually um, most phantom limbs are not after amputation, and most phantom limbs do not hurt. So I will uh, kind of concentrate um, on this uh, non 
painful non-amputation phantoms and focus on selected aspects that illustrate a little bit the properties uh, given to the soul, immaterial character, primordial nature, maybe a little bit of seeing with one's eyes. I mean, one uh, non-material um, property of phantom limbs is um, that they don't have anything to do with matter. Yet, if you ask an amputee, a hand amputee, to approach his um, stump uh, to a wall, then you will see either one of two reactions. Either, uh, well, the phantom limb is just within the wall. The patient says, well, what? <laughs> what's the matter? These are different kinds of matter. Or the phantom limb vanishes because it cannot be tolerated that it is superimposed by, by kind of um, physical matter. Nobody uh, um, knows, it's about 50 to 50%. 50 it, it vanishes or it, it remains. And nobody knows the personality characteristics of, of the two groups of people, but it's uh, very important clinically and uh, for rehabilitation purposes. Uh, think of prosthesis fitting. You have to, it's, you have to reset, resurrect your body uh, with a prosthesis, with a technical prosthesis, and handle uh, these myoelectric instruments. So it's uh, at least to be expected that those shunning matter and those tolerating matter um, are different in this process. Here is a, an elderly gentleman uh, who had a phantom limb of his, of his left arm. A couple of months of the removal, he didn't have pain. Uh, he is asked here, I originally had a, I also had technical problems. I had a video um, a clip here, but I will explain. He lays the phantom hand on, <coughs> on the, the table and points out where it is roughly and all of a sudden I place a pile of books in the location where the phantom is and ask where is it now and, and he is stupefied and, and thinks well it's, it's gone and will point, you don't see it, you must believe it, points to his head and says uh, it must have been shot out here, shot off here. And it's a very intelligent response by a, a gentleman without any uh, academic education. So we, we don't do these things for fun, of course. We do these things to establish possibly a method for alleviating pain. It would be nice if somebody could just held his painful phantom against the wall and it would vanish. Unfortunately, this is not the case. Even in patients who have pain, uh, the pain usually persists once the phantom limb vanishes totally. And this reminds me a little bit of Alice in Wonderland, the Cheshire Cat, where uh, the uh, smile rests upon the leaves and the, the cat has uh, removed, been removed. Phantom limbs in paraplegia uh, tell us a very important lesson. You see here um, a gentleman who suffered uh, complete uh, paraly paralysis of his two legs after a spinal cord section sitting on a motorcycle. And he feels uh, his, his uh, phantom legs in a position he had sitting on that motorcycle. You see he has his eyes closed and that's essential because would he open uh, the eyes, uh, he would correct the phantom percept, and that's why in paraplegia, uh, phantom percepts are not that vivid and not that long-lasting as in uh, the amputation of both legs, for instance, uh, because you see that the, uh, also the patient sees that the physical legs are still present. So seeing and feeling interact. And one ingenious exploitation of that uh, seeing and feeling interaction is that mirror box uh, famously uh, invented by Ramachandran uh, were actually uh, right hand amputees with a clenched fist uh, which produces the pain. Actually, this, these are patients who say, when I only could, and this is a phantom hand, when I only uh, were able to open that fist, the pain would be gone. Now, this 
person inserts the hand to the right of a mirror, mimics the, pos the posture of the fingers, this clenched posture with the existing hand, and uh, has it to the la inserts it into the mirror box and observes how the mirror image of his left hand slowly opens. So this produces in the brain a superimposition of felt and seen hand, which can alleviate phantom limb pain in at least some amputees. But in the popular press, this has been heavily exaggerated, the, the values of mirror therapy. Uh, it only works if you have a, if your pain is due to a clenched posture. Otherwise, you cannot just uh, show the brain um, a mirror image of an opening hand. Seeing and feeling interactions also play a role in uh, eliciting uh, phantom limbs in normal uh, people. You and me, we also have phantom limbs, we have a phantom body. But we don't notice this because there is a perfect overlay between phantoms and physical body. Now, as soon as we dissociate the physical and the phantom, uh, then we, we feel the phantom hand. This is the rubber hand illusion. The person here uh, observes touch being applied to a rubber hand. He knows that's a, only a rubber hand. Uh, simultaneously uh, applied by the experimenter, uh, touch to the, his real right hand, which is out of vision. And after a while, uh, synchronous uh, stimulating at irregular uh, intervals, but at, at corresponding locations, produces the feeling that you are actually owning that hand. So you are in the, in the, in the rubber hand. You measure that or quantify that illusion by questionnaire. Of course, you can ask, uh, was it nice, this illustration? Well, well, were you in the rubber hand? This is not, I, I don't like these things, this verbalization stuff. You measure that by prior to illusion induction. You have the person indicate where in space the finger middle finger of the right hand, the 2P stimulated hand is, and then you do that afterwards. And then you will see a proprioceptive drift, a drift in space towards the rubber hand. This quantifies illusion strength. The larger that drift, the larger um, is that proprioceptive drift. But quite analogously, uh, you can induce an out-of-body experiences, an, an out-of-body experience in, in normal subjects. You move it, take a person from behind while she is stimulated on the back, like in the rubber hand experiment. Now imagine she sees an online image of that movie and sees herself a couple of meters in advance. So, and this regular stimulation produces the uh, illusion that you are actually about three or four meters in before in front of your body. You can also measure that by proprioceptive drift. I mean, of course, these lab-induced out-of-body experiences are just <laughs> worlds apart from the phenomenal experience of an out-of-body experience as described in the medieval literature, summarized by you, or in the modern parapsychological literature. A little bit closer come elderly, older uh, experiments here by George Malcolm Stratton, who is famous for his inversion lens experiments. And he, he used to walk during days with a mirror device on his shoulders uh, and he has always seen an, an image of his body suspended in the air until uh, he literally said he would feel uh, mentally outside his body. I myself repeated that a little time later, that's in the, in the yellow jacket here. I had movie taped myself from behind. Hmm? Now imagine I'm walking through the streets of Colonia uh, just seeing myself moving through the streets of Colonia a couple of meters ago, and once I insert a letter into a letter box, I mean, this is really intriguing and eerie in a way that you are on the place of action. You are no longer here. Of course, the touch with the feet on the floor, on the, on the, on the street, 
binds you to the body still a little bit, but actions observed suck you out of the body. Still, it's far away from the uh, medieval times and, and uh, from other parapsychological accounts, but here we have an instance of early parapsychology uh, description of an out-of-body experience of somebody who was out of body and went through the doors, uh, went through the doors of uh, his apartment although he could also have gone through the walls, he writes. So there is a top-down influence of what you can do in your astral body or out of body. Now, so the message is we have to differentiate the neural correlates of an out of body experience or an out of limb experience and the phenomenal aspects for those persons who really experience these type of things. And uh, critical is the temporal parietal junction. Uh, this is an area in the brain, posterior part of the brain, which is strategically optimally suited in connection with out of body experiences because it, it combines areas responsible for some of the sensation, uh, so feeling touches and so on, uh, vestibular information, the vestibular system um, uh, allows the the sense of equilibrium, so where is your body in space, or you're upside down and stuff like that, or hovering. And of course, it's close to the visual cortex and also to the limbic system in the temporal cortex, so where the emotions are. The temporal parietal junction has been the, the key area where uh, this is an overlap of several patients, lesions, um, who reported all uh, out-of-body experiences has been considered key for the experience of out-of-body experiences. And in fact, the elicitation, the active elicitation of uh, out-of-body experiences by cortical electrical stimulation, that's the arrow on the left side here, um, has been confined first uh, in, in, the, in the very first report um, of, of uh, this type of uh, experimental induction of OBEs uh, has been confined to the temporal parietal junction, but later on, this is a much more uh, modern view here, uh, we proceed and, and, and stimulate uh, differently. We, we also look for interoceptive information. The body there uh, flashes to the rhythm of my own heartbeat. And this greatly enhances the, the illusion of being out there. But it also enhances the number of uh, regions in the brain considered uh, key to elicit such uh, experiences. So maybe it's easier to map the phantom hand or a phantom limb to the brain. Hmm? You all know that, uh, you may have heard, that after the loss of a hand, the former hand area gets responsible to neighboring areas in, in the homunculus. So from the face and from the upper part of the hand, uh, stimuli will be processed newly. And at this time, I always have to apologize with the ladies in the audience and also at home uh, offline. Of course, it's not a homunculus in your brain, but it's a, a little femincula. <laughs> it's all quite similar the principles, except that the genitals are different, but they are still close to the, to the feet. And after amputation of the foot, sexual activity, micturation, etc., stimulation of the, of the genitals leads to a heightened awareness of phantom feet in men and in, in women. I'm sure in, term, in times of uh, uh, transcending gender binaries, that we also have kind of, um, you know, um, transunculum or uh, diverse queeruncula in our brains. And the important thing is um, we have not just one homunculus, femuncula, etc., but we have, it, we have them at different levels of the brain. This is just the standard way we, we show it. We have also thalamic, uh, deep, uh, subcortical regions where we have homunculi. And, as we have seen, 
uh, phantom limb percept, phantom hand percept, for instance, is uh, also modified by visual information and by top-down uh, information about how uh, matter behaves if it comes in superposition, possibly mediated by the prefrontal lobes. So it's not possible to localize or map a phantom hand to the brain. It's not that easy. It's just almost everywhere. The question now, a new chapter, the question of primordiality. So the primacy of the mental over the physical. I would like to introduce um, a set who was in her 40s when we worked with her uh, for years. She was born uh, with a whitish body, but uh, claimed to have phantoms of virtually all body parts. Huh? Of course, nobody believed her. All doctors tell, uh, told her, yes, oh, of course, uh, we believe her. But she noticed that nobody would believe her. I was very skeptical at the beginning. And uh, I did a little experiment, if you want. I asked her, do you also fold her phantom arms sometimes, and she said, uh, which surprised me in a way, uh, sometimes I do, rarely, but some, yes, and now I'm asking you what I asked her then, please fold your arms. Also, people at home, please, the, the <laughs> online thing. yeah, anyway, and I, I asked her which arm is in front, she said the left one, and then I, I told her, and I tell you, people online, uh, do it the other way around, please. Well, you have kind of a British politeness. <laughs> Usually, it's, it's, there is a, a noise in the audience. Oh, oh, gosh. And that's exactly the noise I heard from her. She said, she shivered in a way and said, oh, gosh, that feels awkward. I would never do that. And that was the point in my uh, research with her that made me turn into a believer in congenital phantoms, in phantoms of congenitally absent limbs. I was skeptical, as I mentioned. So, of course, um, not of course, but I think I'm trusting or valuing such tiny little clinical observations more than all neuroimaging work, but th this, this, um, this has this is gone, this, <laughs> I don't value it that more that I would extinguish a, a, a slide, a whole slide. But you must believe me, the slide is, is now gone, uh, you must believe me that we put her in the scanner while she moved her, uh, her phantom hand, her right phantom hand. And we saw, lo and behold, activation in the brain, uh, bilateral activation, I have to say. It's not the same as in a, in a traumatic amputee who activates the primary sensory motor era of the hand in the contralateral hemisphere. But in, in her it was bilateral, but not the primary motor, uh, sensory motor eras, but higher order uh, parietal lobe, uh, SPL, superior parietal lobule, would this, uh, uh, the slideshow, uh, and we come back to that. And together, I would say that work with a set uh, really uh, proves that uh, phantoms of, of uh, limbs never physically uh, realized are a scientific fact. This does not mean that the traditional interpretation of phantoms as perceptual motor memories of one's own limbs. I mean, there was touch for decades and there was uh, motor planning for decades. It would not be important. But it's just not sufficient to account for this uh, special type of phantoms. It's also not the case that this would prove some other people have overinterpreted, in my opinion, our own uh, findings here and have said, oh, that's the proof that body schema is innate. It, there must be a genetic component. Maybe there is, but it does not prove that because um, <coughs> a set could have established a somatic representation, a phantom feeling, by observing other people moving their hands and limbs. And this is uh, due to the mirror neuron system. You certainly have heard about mirror neurons. These are um, neurons 
or neuron systems that code for, uh, for an action, like a pinch, grip, and watching a conspecific to execute the whole pinch grip, the, the same pinch grip. Okay? So she could have, by, she, she's a keen observer. And I always say uh, it's ethically a bit borderline to even think of such a case. But as long as we don't have a case born with her, without arms, without legs, born blind, and still say, I have phantom, and we could actually objectify these, we cannot falsify such a, uh, an opinion. So I s somehow poetically refer to these phantom, this type of phantom limbs of congenitally absent limbs as an animation without incarnation. So there is kind of an animation of some extracorporeal space, which has never been incarnated, never been flesh. In neurology, it's very often the case that we have a mirror image of something. Now, what could be the mirror Im image of that? It's covered here. It's, of course, saying incarnation without animation. So what could that be? I expose it. In my opinion, it is body integrity dysphoria. That's uh, patients who come to the doctor and say, I, I want to have my left leg removed. Um, they are very specific, not, not just the whole leg, but at a very uh, clear demarcation line, they want to have a cut there, because they do not own that, that limb. So in this, still in this poetic view, it is kind of something that has been uh, incarnated, but it's, it's not, there is no soul in it, there is no ownership in it there. This is, by the way, uh, according to WHO criteria, a mental disorder beginning of this very year. Before it was just a bizarre thing or an, an internet-induced madness. So I think, neurologically speaking, these are mirror conditions of one another. And lo and behold, we have, and here we have it, the superior parietal lobule to the, ah, we have the, the AZ activation pattern that was uh, referring to you without slide, and we find also in these uh, persons with body integrity dysphoria, we find functional and structural alterations in various regions of the brain. The very first study was just about the superior parietal lobule, uh, where the maximal activation uh, blob was in a SETS brain, Later came S1, S2, the, the primary somatosensory areas, insula, premotor, and so on. So this is, called, this is what is usually called blobology. We have more and more spots of uh, colored brain areas which are activated in some uh, studies. And I would like to uh, make you aware of this blobology problem by just uh, exposing three slides taken from a, a commercial for dental floss. Now, w what's wrong here in, in, in this picture? Where do you see the blob? I could expose them, them for, uh, for minutes, but um, the problem is that you may not have noticed that this lady has six fingers here. <laughs> Where does this third arm of the lady come from? And this poor gentleman lacks a right ear. So what I'm saying is that by mere uh, evoking the imagination that it's about dental floss, you automatically look uh, at the teeth, of course, and see that little spot there. It's a nice commercial. It shows some, some uh, psychological principle. And it shows also a little bit what I think that in uh, current day neuroscience happens, that one has very many spots activated. And it's, it's kind of a neurological Rorschach, in a way, very pro project uh, some meaning. So as long as you look in the brain, you will find the cerebral correlate of any bodily peculiarity. And this does not mean that this uh, particular correlate is actually causative in generating that pe peculiarity. That's, that's very important. And as it has been mentioned uh, years and decades ago, body schema is more than just a brain issue. It is an issue of 
interactions between brains and societies. Think of BID, body integrity dysphoria, as a as a disturbance of which certainly depends on bodily, um, on cultural. Uh, implications of having a body and how the body is shaped and so on. So that's what he already mentioned in, in 2013 at the first uh, international conference on, on BID, that uh, an understanding of BID requires combined efforts of neurology, psychology, psychiatry, psychiatry and sociology. Uh, purely neurological is only the representation of uh, single limbs in the cortex or subcortically. Even in phantom limbs, as we have seen, large cerebral circuits are involved. And also this uh, primordial nature of phantom limbs is at least debatable. We don't know whether body schema is acquired or uh, there is a genetic component. And uh, yeah, lastly, uh, the phenomenal content, as I mentioned, of out-of-body experiences is a totally different, on a totally different sheet than the neural correlates. So in a nutshell, uh, phantomology, whether current day nor future, will not be able to really capture the soul. Thank you.